Okay, and we're back. Hour number two in a world that is obviously in great angst. Shall we put it that way? We could go on and on. David Bloom is with us tonight. David is a man who has a solution. David has a number of solutions, and he has been working literally tirelessly for, I guess, decades to try to make the world aware of the fact that we do not have to be prisoners of big oil or a corrupted, obviously deadly nuclear power industry and all the fallout uh, literally and figuratively from both of those uh, energy consortiums which seek to strangle the economic life out of the public and keep it absolutely at bay, if not in leg irons. David, are you there? I've been following a little bit your coverage of Japan, and uh, gosh, it's very difficult to get good information out of Japan about what's really going on there at this point. It's a cultural issue. Uh, the government has always been secretive. It doesn't, by nature of its history, share with the public. Uh, in fact, the emperor himself uh, said that he didn't have all the answers, so he was being obviously kept in the dark. The government and TEPCO and others uh, don't seem to be communicating much with anybody, let alone uh, perhaps even themselves. We just don't, we do not know. What we do know is that we don't know, and that's not very comforting. Well, you know, one of the things about this is it was, it's completely unnecessary for us to be doing uh, nuclear power at all. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, Absolutely agree with you. Yeah. You know, the, I mean, the only reason why in the United States we ever supported nuclear power was because we needed the byproducts from nuclear power for our weapons program. And so, uh, you know, we promoted the so-called peaceful atom, but there was never anything really um, economically feasible about it at all. It was a way of getting a lot of fissionable material fast. And so, you know, when you start backing up from that and say, well, okay, that was then, you know, and the, the nuclear Cold War is, you know, now we now know it's unwinnable and unfightable and impossible to even consider. What are we doing with all these plants? So what should we be doing instead to make our electricity? And it's not like the first time that we've shut down plants. Here in California, uh, the Sacramento plant had so many near meltdowns that finally people said enough and we shut down the nuclear power plant here in Sacramento. And it's still making electricity today, but not with nuclear power. So, you know, the idea that we have to make electricity is really a simple matter of spinning a magnet inside a copper uh, coil. And any way you can spin that magnet makes electricity. Now, you can spin it with steam in a turbine, you know, uh, using, you know, superheated boiling water, which, you know, nuclear uh -huh. power is supposed to be making. Right. But there's so many other ways to spin a magnet. And actually, the very same turbine, the general electric turbines that make electricity in Japan mm -hmm. are certified now by GE to make alcohol-powered electricity around the world. And they're installing them, new ones, essentially the same as the ones that are in Japan, hmm. for alcohol production to electricity in Brazil today. We that's, can that's, convert those plants. That's fascinating. So the, the turbine itself can be used by alcohol fuel. That's wonderful. That's very interesting news. It might be a saving grace for GE somewhere along the line. At least a, a marginal effort could be made on their behalf to make them look good. Well, gee, we can use our our turbines for alcohol-fueled energy production. Well, great. Okay. Well, what we have is an issue here that is so far out of control, we don't really know because they're afraid to tell us and won't tell us. Tell me more about the Sacramento plant. I remember when that was closed down. How many years ago was that approximately, David? Oh, that's got to be... 20, 25, something like that? Maybe 20 years ago, yeah. It was a really, a really shoddily built plant. Um, and so they were having uh, scrams, you know, uh, and right. near meltdowns, it seemed like every two or three months. And finally, the, the uh, ratepayers said, you know, we're, we're fed up with this. It's not on half the time. We have to buy expensive power when it's not on. Let's just do something reliable. And so they switched it over to natural gas because it was a natural gas pipeline nearby to use. And uh, so they make their steam that way, and they spin their turbines, and, you know, no big deal. But, of course, someday 
the ratepayers got up to pay to disassemble, you know, disassemble this incredibly toxic, radioactive uh, building that, uh, you know, basically is so expensive to take apart that it would just bankrupt any utility that tries to do it. Exactly. So that's, why we haven't, yeah. that's why we haven't seen any of these nuclear power plants when they're finished be disassembled because no one wants to know what that really costs. That's a very important point. It's not just a question of closing them, pulling the fuel rods and saying no more. It's what the heck do you do with the residue, and that's all the equipment. Oh, I assume that, and that plant's name was Rancho Seco, by the way. I assume right. that uh, all the fuel rods are sitting right there in those uh, in-ground swimming pools, which are not permanent housing for them. They're still sitting at Rancho Seco. There's nowhere to take them. The reactor is still sitting there. It's It's not fueled. And they're using the plant, the, the turbine part of the plant, now with natural gas to make electricity. Okay, uh, on the face of it, a reasonable solution. I believe the plant in, I talk on it, the one on the coast, is it, was it near Eureka? Uh, I actually I, heard that they're beginning to try to decommission the one in Eureka, the very first yeah. prototype commercial nuclear power plant in the nation, which has been shut for at least 25 years. Yeah. And they're, you know, but see, the problem with decommissioned plants, or I should say plants that are not being used, is the radiation begins in the core, and as the plant gets older, it keeps penetrating the concrete and steel farther and farther from the core, mm -hmm. so you have to keep shutting down parts of the plant that people can go into. Huh. And, the, and so at some point, you got to say, oh, there's nothing, there's, you can't even service the plant anymore, it's radioactive too far from the core, and so you shut it down. This, you know, this is provided something else that doesn't shut the plant down, like a steam explosion or a containment breach. But uh -huh. the point is, even without those things, the nature of radioactivity means the plant gets more and more hot away from the center, and at some point, everybody just has to not work there anymore. I never but heard that before. That's fascinating. Yeah. And you can't just leave it there because the radiation that, even when you pull the fuel rods out and put them in their storage pool, the radiation continues to work its way out to the outside, and someday it'll get there. So you can't even bury a nuclear power plant in a big cube of concrete because eventually the radiation will work to the outside of whatever container you yeah. try to pour over it. So well, that, that's happening at Chernobyl right now, and there the, the concrete tomb is falling apart. Uh, the radiation is actually uh, deconstructing it, so to speak, and they're going to have to build a much larger containment area around it with concrete and boron and so forth. So, uh, point well taken. Rancho Seco was shut down in 1989, let's call it 22 years ago. Uh, the Eureka plant is, as David said, just to recap, the first one that efforts are being made at now to actually take them apart, the components, and get them out of there. They're actually trying to... to it's the first plant in the world I've heard this, uh, this stage of deconstruction underway. So, And they don't talk about it. You know, I just happen to know somebody who's working there, and that's why I heard about it. But it's not commonly talked about in the press because really no one wants to talk about what it'll cost. Now, you know, think about Love Canal for a minute. You know, some of us are old enough to remember that in New York where they built a housing tract on top of a toxic waste dump. People forgot the toxic waste dump was there after, I don't know, 20, 30 years, and then built houses over it, thinking, oh, this is cheap real estate. I wonder why it's so cheap. Let's build houses here. How are you going to take a look at storing nuclear waste and nuclear contaminated concrete and steel for a minimum of 250,000 years? And some of that stuff actually doesn't stop being radioactive for four and a half billion years, which is about when the sun burns out. So... You know, we'd have other problems to worry about at that Well, they're going to, obviously, they're going to have, we have to pause here for a minute, David. They're going to have to find a way to transmute uh, radioactive atoms into non-radioactive atoms at some point. That's uh, hard science, and it's probably doable, but we don't have the ability now. Uh, David, Daryl Hanna is with us now. How is your car, Daryl? Uh, that's a good question. David's driving it right now. <laughs> yes. well, yeah, yeah, we picked it up yesterday from... Daryl's place down in Southern California, and we uh, drove through the storm all the way up here to uh, Santa Cruz, and it, you know, 
believe me, this is such a wonderful car that everyone that passes us on the road is waving and thumbs up. You know, <laughs> because true. It's an excellent spokes vehicle for alcohol fuel, that's for sure. It's the Trans Am from Kill Bill. I have up on, on my site, Daryl, a real-time read of the counts per minute of radioactivity in the West L.A., Santa Monica area. Oh, Let wow. Me, what is it? It's 50 right now, and they say that you don't have to worry until it gets to 100, but 50 is enough for me, I, I worry. How how are you personally viewing this and, and your friends down there? How is the awareness level of the potential fallout from this disaster, this unnecessary catastrophe in the nuclear power plant at Fukushima in Japan? Well, it's interesting. You know, I mean, I uh, uh, fortunately, I have a lot of friends who are... Um, you know, very informed and educated. I even had a friend that was yesterday walking around with a Geiger counter. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. Wow. Um, he used to actually carry it on planes with him, you know, in the days when you, did, you could just travel on planes. Well, people don't uh, know that flying at, at high altitude does expose you to... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. What, what he was trying to show. Is like first, mm-hmm. The first time he said he went on a plane, um, he was shocked to see it soaring up into the hundreds and, and was wondering if there was some kind of, you know, plutonium or, or something in the hold. But then it, he, you know, then learned that, that every time you fly, you're exposed to enormous amounts of radiation. That's right. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think that, you know, pe- people are, 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 that we're in a time of crisis and people are, are so caught up in their, their, their daily concerns and just trying to get by right now that, uh, you know, huh. I, I think that this isn't on the forefront of most people's minds, of uh, things to worry about. You know, they're just trying to make their, uh, you know, make their bills. That's, so, all, that's all very true. Uh, we didn't need this now as a society or a, a culture. Well, We've we got do need a wake-up call, and, this and is um, it. I think this is part of it, you know. Yeah. This is definitely part of... of, of of our lesson that we need to start getting back into harmony with Mother Nature, like you said. Are, are you seeing anybody down there with masks on yet? Um, no, I haven't seen that. All right. Well, it, it, those days may be coming. Uh, hopefully, everyone listening has some put away. They're N, called N95 masks, and just common sense would suggest that in addition to food, for at least a month, you have uh, a supply of these very inexpensive masks because you just never know. Uh, and the situation in Japan is nebulous at best. They're not telling us what's really going on there. We've established that. I don't know if you have heard yet, Daryl, but a number of scientists around the world now, nuclear scientists, are expressing anger and some outrage at the incredible lack of information that is forthcoming from Japan. They don't know what the heck is going on there. Yeah, well, you know, that's sort of status quo in, in, in this sort of modern age. I mean, we, you know, we still have yet to, to know exactly what chemicals were released at the Bhopal tragedy, which was over 20 years ago, you know. Good point. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, a, um, it's unfortunate. You know, this is, is something that should concern everybody, every living thing, you know. So We talked um, earlier uh, in this hour with David about the closure of the Rancho Seco nuclear plant and the Humboldt Bay plant up in Eureka. So two in California have been actually closed. And the process, it's not just like turning the lights out, and we made that clear. The process of actually decommissioning these plants is a very long and extensive ordeal, very expensive, and at least two of them have been shut down in terms of day-to-day operations go with it. But all those spent nuclear fuel rods are all sitting there, every one of them. Yeah, and there's still, you know, quite a few plants that are still operational. And, you know, there was an earthquake in, in Southern California, uh, I think it was the day before yesterday. It was 3.3. It was a rel- relatively small one, but it was right off the coast here um, in Malibu. So, um, you know, it's, uh, and we've got we've got um, you know San Luis Obispo right there on the beach and I mean Diablo Canyon appropriately named uh, yeah. could could literally spew uh, death all over Southern California. It's yeah, got so that it's potential. Definitely time to, to for some sane options and we have them. And David is you know, the, the you know sort of the making the call to you know to to get on to get on board and get on the good foot and start start. Uh, taking responsibility and and the great news is is that you know now it not only makes sense uh for to our health and to the you know long-term health of the planet and not the, every other living thing but it also makes sense for your pocketbook 
because the price of gas is so high now that the price of alcohol fuel is less than than a gallon of gas, you know. So sure. it makes sense in every way. Yeah, exactly. Not one nuclear power plant in this country has ever turned a profit, nor will any ever do so. Mm-hmm.